We have breaking news in our national lead. Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott has tested positive for coronavirus. Abbott is fully vaccinated and experiencing no COVID symptoms, according to his office, which added in a statement that Abbott will isolate and undergo daily testing while receiving the Regeneron antibody treatment. Video shared by Abbott's campaign on Twitter shows the governor in a packed room during an event last night. Abbott's office says everyone who has been in close contact with Governor Abbott has been notified. More breaking COVID news, this time in Florida, where the State Board of Education is holding an emergency meeting right now to consider what to do about school districts that have enacted mask mandates in open defiance of Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis has even threatened to withhold pay from school official, officials who allow mask mandates. Let's go to CNN's Leila Santiago in Miami. And Leila, the, the meeting's ongoing, but we're told by school board officials that the issue isn't whether mandatory masks are good or bad, it's only about following the rules. Correct. And the education commissioner here in Florida is actually recommending that the board uh, enact or enforces, uses their enforcement powers and says that two schools, two school districts in particular, Broward and Alachua, are not in compliance with the governor's executive order. The superintendent from Alachua just testified. We also heard public comments just a minute ago. But I got to tell you, uh, this is something that became very political very quickly. The commissioner starting off this meeting uh, attacking President Biden uh, as, as, as far as how he is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also heard some of the public comments go down that same route. And I can tell you from the school board districts that I checked in with, a lot of them are watching, have their eyes and ears on this meeting right now to see how they will proceed with mask mandates in the future. And this is in a state well, we just got this reporting, uh, 4,500 COVID cases and 11,000 students in quarantine among the largest districts uh, in the state. Uh, school hasn't even begun in some of the largest districts, Broward County starting tomorrow uh, and Miami-Dade a few days away as well. Jake? All right, Leila Santiago in Miami, Florida, thank you so much. Sources are telling CNN that the TSA mask mandate was just extended, which means you're going to have to keep masking up on planes and trains at least until mid-January. Let's bring in CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Sanjay, as always, you and I, we don't, it's not about Democrats or Republicans or school, you know, scoring points or dunking on the libs or the conservatives or whatever. It's about the science. Scientifically, um, would a vaccine mandate make more sense than a mask mandate? Well, I, I think they're they're both important, and that's not skirting the question, Jake. But you know, I think t a lot of times people sort of see these things as part of you know, just just another mitigation strategy. Vaccines are really good at preventing people from getting sick uh, if they've been exposed. The thing about masks, Jake, at right now, because there is so much viral transmission, we're being showered in virus. So at some point when we're not all being showered in virus, uh, you know, I think we can start to think about lifting mask mandates. But they're, 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 they're a little bit different. Ultimately, you know, it might be a situation where people should get vaccinated and still have masks available in, in times when there's a lot of virus out there, kind of like, you know, you take an umbrella in, in a thunderstorm. So mask mandates on planes, you know, and, and things like that, they stuck with it, even when the CDC sort of lifted the mask guidance in the middle of May. Uh, TSA planes, you still had to wear masks. And they're basically looking at the data now and saying, there's still a lot of virus out there. In fact, the numbers obviously have gone back up. So for the time being, they're going to maintain that mask mandate. I think vaccine mandates are, are coming in many places as well, or, or at least this idea that in order to do X, you have to be vaccinated. You don't get to do this unless you're vaccinated. We're gonna see more and more of that. Let's talk about this other breaking coronavirus news. Texas Governor Abbott testing positive. He is vaccinated. He is not showing symptoms. We're all happy for that. So why would he be treated with uh, Regeneron's monoclonal antibody treatment if he's not showing symptoms? Well, th there's been a, a couple of studies uh, around this now, you know, where, where basically, broadly speaking, the Regeneron, the monoclonal antibodies, their purpose, the outcome measure is to keep people out of the hospital. So that's, that's one of the things. And first they were testing it primarily in people who had mild symptoms or high risk of potentially having to go to the hospital. And they found that it had very good efficacy there. And then there was a trial looking at asymptomatic people as well. Again, people who might be considered high risk or higher likelihood of needing to be hospitalized. So it's sort of 
that's the way these antibodies are supposed to work. In a sense, you know, the vaccines induce antibodies. They, they teach your body how to make antibodies. With Regeneron, you're essentially giving those antibodies. They're not gonna last as long as the antibodies you get from a vaccine. That's why the vaccination is still important. But the whole point is to give them early, early when people are either minimally or asymptomatic. And if they are given early, it can help pre prevent the disease from progressing and the person needing to be hospitalized. Let's turn to booster shots because we're told the Biden administration is expected to suggest for most adults, a third dose uh, when 30% of the eligible U.S. population still refuses to get the shot, kids under 12 still cannot get them. Should boosters still be top priority as opposed to having the vaccine okayed for kids under 12 and 30% of the country still won't get vaccinated? I think that the other things you're mentioning are a bigger priority, simple as that. And I, I know there's a lot of discussion about this back and forth. I've talked to a lot of people about this and people have strong views on this. Fact of the matter is 99% of the people who are in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. Most of the transmission that's occurring in this country are because of the unvaccinated. We don't even have good data to show that the vaccine is actually waning in terms of effect, its effectiveness. Hopefully the CDC will share some of this data because this keeps happening, Jake, where these policy decisions are getting floated out there, even made, and we don't see data on it. Let me show you what data we do have. Uh, this is some data that I think may be influencing their decision, but when you look at Moderna, you look at Pfizer and you compare them from January to July, this is against all infections, Jake. Okay, so this may be people who have no symptoms. This may be people who showed up at the hospital. It's all comers and they see some drop off, but there is obviously a lot of people out there who may have relatively mild symptoms with these breakthrough infections. That's why the next graph I'm gonna show you is sort of a critical one. And that has been, you know, how well do these vaccines accomplish the outcome measures that they are originally intended to, to accomplish, which is to keep people from getting severely ill. Jake, it's still pretty good, right? 91.6% yeah. for Moderna, 85% for Pfizer. It's not quite 100% anymore, but it's very close to 100% in terms of preventing deaths. So I think what, what they're gonna have to do in terms of recommending these booster shots is square this idea of that data and, and why they're recommending boosters broadly. For immunocompromised people, yeah. Uh, for people who are considered vulnerable for some reason, sure. Should you and I, Jake, go out and get boosters? It's pretty hard to beat those numbers. I will say that a, you know, a terrible sort of cold in my dad, for example, who's close to 80 versus in me, would be a much more significant thing for him. So I could see vulnerable people potentially benefiting from boosters. But for us, I think it's, it's hard to make the case, especially when so much of the world has simply not had access yet. What about those who got that single J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Will they need to get a second shot? Well, th this is a source of frustration, I realize. I get more emails and, and social about this than anything else. And I wanna, I wanna put this up here. This is the, the statement from the CDC. And we tried to break this down a little bit to give you an idea of exactly what they're thinking about. First of all, keep in mind that there's about uh, 22 million or so, I believe, uh, people who've received this. Uh, and they started getting these vaccines later, so there's less data. They continue to review the science, they said. They do believe that boosters are probably going to be needed and they say they're gonna release some detailed plans soon about this, but they, they want the FDA and CDC to weigh in on this. So what we're likely to hear about tomorrow, Jake, is regarding Moderna and Pfizer. But I know a lot of people out there got the J&J, &J, they want that data. The reason they don't have it yet is because there's fewer patients and, there's, and it's a, a less time that the vaccine's been out there. But I think all signals point to the fact that boosters will be necessary. And as you know, Jake, some places like San Francisco have already started doing it. Why is it taking so long for kids under 12 to be able to get approved to get the vaccine? I mean, I, there is, has to be a whole body of research of, of kids 13 and 14 years old who can't biologically be all that different from an 11 year old. Uh, what's the holdup? Well, I, I think with the, with the slightly older kids up till 16, they did bridge the data from adults to sort of make uh, the case that uh, 12 to 16 year olds could be uh, receiving this by, by using some of that data. I think when they're going younger than that, they're basically saying, look, you know, there are things that happen during that time frame, puberty, things like that, that may change how people are metabolizing the vaccine. But I think it's primarily safety, it's primarily getting the dosing right, and it's balancing the risk reward here because we know these kids are at lower risk, so you gotta make sure the reward is, is, is uh, you know, equal in terms of what it's providing.